Welcome to the second chapel service of the semester. We are so happy to have all of you here with us tonight. Um, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and then I'll introduce you all to our speaker, who honestly needs no introduction. But let's pray, y'all. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful for a chance to gather together, Lord. We are so thankful for the folks who are here in person, God, to gather together and to hear your word. Lord, we are so thankful for the folks who are watching online, Lord, who have also come to hear something from you. God, I ask that you would open our hearts this evening to help us receive that which you would have us receive. God, I also ask that you would speak through Dr. Williams, Lord, and lead him, God, and give him um, just the things that we need to hear. God, we love you so much, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So our speaker tonight is Dr. H. Fritz Williams, who again, I know he needs no introduction. Dr. Williams earned his Master of Divinity at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and his doctorate in ministry from United Theological Seminary. I have been privileged to serve with Dr. Williams here at Stark for a little over three years, but more importantly, he has been serving in his church, First Baptist Church in Lockhart, Texas, for over nine years. That makes him what we call here a practitioner scholar, which means that not only does he teach y'all what he preaches and what he practices, but he has to practice what he preaches. So y'all help me welcome Dr. Williams. Thank you to Professor Nichols for that introduction. And uh, I must say with an introduction like that, with the energy that she has, I might need to take her with me, amen, <laughs> wherever I go so that she can begin to spend the energy for me, amen, before I get up to preach. Thank you so much, my colleague and our theological Librarian, amen. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Certainly, I am, uh, I am honored to be able to be one to follow Dr. Salelli in chapel on uh, uh, this year or this semester for start. And here we go, amen. Because at my church, I can take as long as I want to, amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Listen, uh, I want us to uh, know this, that we have one in our midst, one of our fellow students who at this time uh, is going through um, um, uh, the passing of his mother as she exits from this life uh, to her uh, earth, uh, heavenly kingdom. Amen. Let us keep in prayer our brother, Brother Lamont Taylor, who left his mother's bedside to come and be here on today. So before we end this message on today, we want to make sure we gather with him and pray with him. Amen? It's all right to say amen because, you know, in the African-American Baptist tradition, amen, I need some amens, all right? All right, all right, all right. Listen, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me do this. I want to talk about uh, our theme is for this year, ministry through the pandemic. Uh, and everyone who comes is sharing some form of experience that they had during the pandemic. I must say, pastoring in a rural area, there were some issues that we had to face during the pandemic. And this sermon on this evening will be some of what I shared with our congregation as we went through uh, various things during the pandemic. In the book of Exodus, chapter number two, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there in the book of Exodus, chapter number two, starting at verse number 23. I don't have long. I need to speed up because I would allow you to take time and find wherever that is. But let me read it for you in your hearing. From the New American Standard Version, amen, 95, amen. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God, 24, Verse 24, so God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant. 
with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. During that period of time, I titled this message, When They Cried. Or you can also take it and say, when you can't take it no more, what do you have left to do? Because I teach our students here to come up with at least a thesis, or as some of my students know, uh, at least push to trying to create a theological principle out of what you have read, amen? amen. When we take advantage of the opportunity to pray to God, God will respond to the prayers or cries of his children or people in time. When it becomes too great, what do you do? How do you respond? How do you cry out? Was the question I posed to First Baptist Church, 514 Natchez Street in Lockhart, Texas. COVID just hit and we did not have any form of technology. You've already heard some of that, even as Dr. Sileli shared just a little bit on last week. And of course, many of you have had the same experience. First Baptist Church, small African-American church, we had no technology. We dreamed of technology, but no one rushed to do it. COVID hit and we had to go into creating our own technology. And usually it's just the pastor. But soon as COVID hit, also we had another national crisis. The crisis of George Floyd being murdered on the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And soon after that, it became one cry after another. Whether it was medical or a national crisis, national health crisis, matter of fact, we just should say a global health crisis, but also it turned into an, 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 an home, uh, at home situation in America with the crisis of George Floyd, and then we began to have political upheaval, and then also it began one thing after another, and at some point, I will say this, regardless of where you stand, left or right, regardless where you were at in your state of being healthy or unhealthy, uh, uh, COVID positive or COVID negative, we all began to cry out. I want you to know this, that even those of us at 514 Netra Street, a place where we call First Baptist, we began to cry out. And as our cries cried out, uh, we had to begin to search for uh, uh, opportunities to still meet together, even though everyone was saying not to meet together. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Thank you, Professor Nichols, for at least responding with some call and response to this message here on today. Because, my brothers and sisters, we all get to a point to where things become too great. And rather than stay in silence, we cry out to the God in which we serve. The God in whom saved our soul. But I like to set a precipice also with this statement is that when those in power, the church, nor the government, government want to hear our prayers or cries for justice and relief, I want you to know today that God will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. And the truth is underscored here in the text that I have read for your hearing on today in Exodus chapter number 2, verses 23 through 25. The Jews or the children of Israel cried out to God for rescue, relief, and deliverance after what? 400 years of enslavement and oppression and suffering at the hands of the Egyptian government. And God responded to their cry. And eventually delivered them out of the hands of their oppressors. 
Now, I want to press upon that, but I keep looking at that time. And listen, at First Baptist Church, I don't have a timekeeper, but I want you to know today that no matter where you're at, how great your suffering is, how great your grief is, how great your oppression is, how great your suffering is, how great uh, the pressure is upon your life, no matter how it is, if you cry out to God, I guarantee you he will hear your cry. David said, David said, and forgive me for not remembering the, 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 the exact number or the uh, uh, passage or the verse in the psalm. David said, I cried out to the Lord and he what? He heard my cry and inclined his ear unto me. Whoo, that's, that's good right there. That's good right there. That's good right there. I'm trying not to get too caught up in this professional setting. But I want you to know that God responded to the cries of Israel for deliverance and help after 400 years of enslavement with oppression and suffering at the hands of Egyptians. Not because he was powerless. I need you to understand that. And during COVID season, many of us as children of God, as baptized, born again believers, and I have to say it because we have some of our Pentecostal brothers and sisters in here, baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, got to the point to where even they uh, began to even have a question mark, is does God really have the power to heal the whole world of COVID? Does God really have the power to save those who have been uh, systematically uh, oppressed in this country? Does God have the power to just give us another chance to make it right in this life before we exit it? I knew I wasn't going to get no amens right there. <laughs> Not because uh, he has, uh, you need to understand, but it's only because he has a purpose and a plan for our lives, even in the midst of moral evil, oppressive rule, personal hardships, and yes, physical suffering. You need to understand right now that God has a purpose for you. I know we say that, and I tell my methods class all the time, listen, I'm not taking Jeremiah 29 and 11 out of context, which sometimes most of us preachers, pastors do, because we don't read the full entire passage to really give it true light to what it really gives us purpose to. But listen, if God created you and you're still here on this earth, you have a purpose and God has a plan. And my brothers and sisters, no matter how much you're going through, no matter how long during this pandemic or as we begin to say post-pandemically rush through this process, listen, we're always going to be sick. Something is always going to get us down. We're not going to always be able to control everything because some of us still have floated into this realm of trying to even control your own soul salvation. But you understand this, that only one sacrifice once and for all could have been made, and that was Jesus' death upon the cross. And no matter how you try to control the situation, you might just lose it instead of saving it. I now know I'm Baptist here now. I know we preach once saved and always saved, but as you see some of the things that go on within this uh, society and world, and sometimes it seems like it's only the picture of what it looks like in America. Listen, Jesus paid the price, but listen, uh, you better watch out because only God knows what he will do to you. It's just like getting ready to get a spanking from your mama or your daddy. I'm talking old school now. Y'all don't spank your kids nowadays. Uh, uh, we used to get it. And we used to think we could get away with stuff because they didn't know. But I want you to know tonight, this evening, that God knows and that you're going to get it. All right, all right. Listen, listen. When you and I, as they did, take the opportunity to pray and cry out in faith to God, I want you to want to drop these points on you. God hears the cries of those who are in distress. 
And if you're in distress now, I want you to know God hears your cry. I want you to know that God honors his covenant to deliver. Hear that. God honors his covenant to deliver. Uh, God had, if you didn't know it by now, established a covenant with Abraham, and these are his descendants. But listen, because of Christ, I'm one of his descendants as well, and the covenant promise belongs to me as well. But I need you also to know tonight that God is hip to his children's dilemma. Uh, I said that hip. I had to throw it in there because I'm a I'm a child of hip hop too. Amen. Like I told my church on Sunday, amen. I'm a, I'm a product of hip hop. I might have been at the beginning, but I watched it evolve and it's still evolving, even though I feel sometimes it's evolving out of control. But I'm also challenging myself to be a greater global hermeneutic to try to understand what they're going to so I can help them through the process. Amen. But God is hip to the dilemmas. No matter what you're going through, God knows. He knows how bad it is, but sometimes he needs you to respond to how bad it is. Say, God, I can't take it no more. Ooh, all right, I travel outside of my context right here. But sometimes you have to get down to the nitty gritty, even like Peter on that water as he stepped out in faith, walked in faith, but also began to drown for the lack of faith. Lord, save me. Heard his cry and reached down his arm and then he said what? Oh ye of little faith. I believe he wasn't only talking to Peter, but I believe he was talking to the rest of them who didn't step out the boat. But that's another sermon sometime again. But as I close out this little message, because I believe Dr. Rimple said I had two more minutes, amen. When we take the opportunity to pray, because this is the conclusion, Brother Jeremy Caruvius, amen. This is my conclusion, amen. When we take the opportunity to pray a crowd to God uh, of our salvation, you can be assured, Brother Curtis, that God will hear your cry. And he will answer by and by. You can be assured God will under honor his covenant to deliver, and you can be assured that God heeds to the dilemma or God is hip to the dilemmas of his children. And I'm so glad that God heard even the sinful cries of the children in due season. After 400 years of silence, God, yes, God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the whole world. Amen. I know I didn't make that connection very smoothly. Amen. But I want you to know there was another period of time where all heaven was shut up. There was silence among the earth. Someone was looking to hear from God and to see his action being played out and displayed in the earth realm. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, because I'm a black Baptist, I got to go to the cross. Amen. Who died on the cross for us once and for all, for the whole entire world, sin, this and even to come. Amen. He was buried and he rose on that third day morning. You want to know how I know he was raised? Because God said in his word that he would raise him from the dead and listen because he raised him from the dead he gave him all authority, all power and as my Pentecostal brothers and sisters said that power not only saves you but that power also can heal you. That power also can deliver you and that power also can give you strength to continue on your journey. That's all I have to say in the words of Forrest Gump. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you now for your word. We pray that, Father, we have been challenged to walk with you much better than what we have, but also we've challenged to pray in the times of tribulation. God, we love you and we thank you for Stark College and Seminary. But most of all, Father, we could not be Stark College and Seminary if it was not for these students. Pray that you would bless them and keep them is our prayer. God, now we pray for our dear brother, Brother Lamont Taylor. We thank you for the gifts of mothers. And Father, we just pray now for him and the rest of his family. 
We pray that you would give them strength and that, Father, that you would bring them together, that you allow it to be peace in their family, that you would give them peace of mind, even though, Father, we naturally and humanely grieve and go through the whole death process. But we pray that you will make this process smooth, that you will allow the family, Father, to be at a place of peace with one another as well as the peace with your will being done in the life of their mother. God, we celebrate you because you love us. And God, because you have a better place for us. Be with Brother Lamont now in Jesus' name and be with us all, we pray. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forever is our prayer. And let the church say, amen.